Excuse us. Pardon me, ma'am. Sorry, sorry. Move it, asshole. Oh, thank God. We got good seats. Damn right we did. So, we got the drinks. We got the popcorn. And the candy. I think we're ready, man. Hey, guys, sorry I'm late. The bathroom here is nuts. Oh, my God, you made it. Yeah. It's about time, Nathan. Damn. Shh. The movie's starting. I'm Nathan Simmons, and I got to re-educate some of the brothers. <laughs> and uh, I'm just a glorified toaster. <laughs> and this is the Silver Linings Playlist, a podcast that tries to find the silver lining in some of cinema's bleakest endings. Yeah. And uh, you're not hearing a third voice right now that's typically with us, and that is because Mally uh, drowned in his cryo tube, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And he was written off before he could even have a chance to shine in this episode. So Yeah, didn't even make it into the screenplay for this one, honestly. Honestly, shame on him for not being around for this one. Like the fact that that he was written off before anything got to happen, it, it's a, <laughs> such a shame. It is. Nathan, we're on the other side of spooky line ins. Finally, I know. Um, we're covering Alien Three though, which is still technically a horror movie. So we're well, yeah, I wasn't totally ready to leave spooky, gross uh, monsters behind. Yeah, and this is very apt that we're talking about this movie this week, right? Because uh, as you can probably tell, Alien Three, directed by David Fincher, mm-hmm. and he has a new movie out this week. That's right. Uh, one I am very much looking forward to seeing. We with maybe my least favorite title of a movie for him uh, ever. <laughs> it's not a great title, but I, you know, uh, what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I've had a, I've had a problem with the way movies and TVs have been named for quite some time now. <laughs> my least favorite is, I think it's an NBC show, uh-huh. and it's just called Evil. Sure, I'm like, come on, <laughs> come on. I think it was around the time Evil came out. You also texted me. This movie's called The Old Man. Yeah, Can we, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the old man, the killer, Eve. I think there's a show called Ghost oh, on one right. of those primetime shows, on one of those network shows. Yeah, I just, yeah. What are we doing? Yeah, we're, we're about one season away from getting a police procedural called City. There's one called 911. <laughs> Almost a 911. There's one called 911. <laughs> yeah, that was a very different show when I tuned in from what I expected. It was. It was. No, I just, I, I don't know what we're doing. I don't, I don't know, know what we're doing with the, how we're naming things lately, but <laughs> I, go, I go back to Halloween kills. I still don't know what that means. No. <laughs> are the kills, are the Halloween kills the people who die in it? Mm-hmm. Are we to believe that the very existence of Halloween kills people? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or is it as uh, past guests and future guests, JT Kelly suggested, uh-huh. it just fucking rips. Halloween kills, Halloween dude. Kills. It's awesome. <laughs> I also don't know that Halloween ended permanently no. with the last movie because they didn't. Uh, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about. We, we've already done those. Yes. Yeah. We're here to talk about a movie that lost its uh, plural, but gained a number. Uh, I gained a number to the cubed version of it. Yeah. Alien cubed. Alien, alien cubed. to the third power. I got a lot to say about this movie. Uh huh. This is the much maligned alien sequel as i'm sure you know people that are familiar with this movie are aware Mm -hmm. this movie was david fincher's first directorial debut yeah and was not under the best circumstances no they they essentially wanted uh some a journeyman who could come in follow orders and get things done what they didn't know is that even as a music video director david fincher was a notorious perfectionist yes and this is kind of the model that a lot of the bigger studios like Marvel and Disney, like what they do now is uh-huh. bring in an indie director that had one success mm-hmm. and we can just push them around to do whatever we want. Yeah. Get the budget down. You know, they they bully these people and <laughs> strip them of their vision and their uniqueness. So if it's the mold and 20th Century Fox did the same thing back then. It's fully fucking crazy to think that we used to have Marvel movies from like Joe Johnston and Shane Black, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That had some uniqueness to them, like some flavor in there. But And I know that you and I are like, <laughs> we're going off on a tangent already, but you and I are like staunch Eternals defenders. Yeah. <laughs> the one movie that had a vision to it. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. It's the one movie where the director wasn't just like, oh, we need someone to like direct the talky bits between all the previs. Right. Yeah. We need someone to actually come in and have a vision and they let they let her do it. Uh-huh. And that's why that movie, for good or for worse, is unique Yeah, in, in that whole field. So. I agree. But with this one, I'll say this. I've seen this movie exactly one time before the rewatch today. Wow. Okay. And like most people, I had kind of written it off because, yeah. oh, that's the one of the bad ones, right? Right. Upon revisiting this, I don't think this movie is that bad. Yeah. I think it's not great. Yeah. But I don't think it's nearly earned the reputation that it has. That is my hot take as well. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So 
I find this movie to be a bit of a mess yep. that comes from the fact that it is cobbled together from multiple screenplays, which I don't know if you want to, because I've got some notes on other versions that were almost made. And I don't know if you want to go through that. In I the- read some of those today, too. If, if you want to get, uh, you know, give me some bullet points. I'm here for it. So, But, but first, my, my, yeah, my hot take is that I think when you are finally sort of you have aliens, look, aliens and alien are two perfect films to me. Yep. I love those movies so much and they're so different from each other and aliens is like the blueprint of how you essentially can switch genres between films and still have it feel of a piece with the preceding movie right three tries to go back to basics and i think one that sort of surprised people at the time and two uh, no uh, most people could not get over the fact that it essentially uh, immediately wipes the slate clean and kills off the cast from the preceding film my least favorite trope (laughs) In a horror movie uh-huh. is the surviving members of the previous movie get wiped off in the opening minutes of the next one. Sure. It's lazy and it's also it also cheapens the previous movie. It like, does. It is a it I'm not voicing anything unique here. It is a huge sin to kill off Newt, Hicks, and basically Bishop. Yes. And not only that, but the way they're killed off, like Newt especially. Oh, yeah. They say, Oh, she drowned in the cryo tube. Then you see her face and she's screaming in terror. Yeah. Like I don't I've seen people like the results of people drowning (laughs) yeah that's what they believe but the context clues from the scene tell us that she died you know terribly in the throes of being attacked by this creature and uh, i just can't i can't deal with it no i it's i totally agree it's a a cardinal sin (laughs) i totally agree but once you if you are able to say okay well i know i don't like that but i can move forward with whatever this new story is i think there are things to really like about this movie it's still it's still not perfect but it, it it's I, I don't think it's nearly the smack in the face that resurrection is oh or my God, yeah or even alien versus predator oh. <laughs> so there there are th- it, it's easy to see why sigourney weaver was brought back for one more not just the paycheck i think that she does get some really interesting things to notes to play in this movie she does that being said most of the early screenplays didn't involve her I know. because they didn't know if she was going to come back I so know. The, the most famous of these is uh, William Gibson writes Alien 3, the famed cyberpunk author who is told uh, first, like, yeah, we got to we got to go bigger and badder than aliens. And his screenplay brought back Michael Bean and Lance Henriksen uh, from Aliens and sort of jettisons Ripley off in an escape pod to maybe come back in Alien 4 if they can afford it. Right. A two parter, which is which his screenplay is probably the most famous of these because it's since been adapted as a comic book, Mm -hmm. a novelization and even an audio drama with Michael Bean and Lance Henriksen. Fucking awesome. Which involves Wayland Yutani, uh, the the company referred to in the first few movies, mm-hmm. experimenting on alien genetic material and essentially accidentally creating an alien virus. Yeah, where in a in a very infamous sequence, a scientist tears off their own skin and there's a xenomorph underneath. That's kind of kind of cool. <laughs> it's kind of rock and roll. And there's yeah, there's some fun ideas. There was a whole sequence where they're like in uh, EVA suits and trying to uh, jettison a, a, an entire space station and destroy it so that the alien virus isn't transmitted to earth Mm -hmm. Uh, and this you know it was eventually they decided this is way too expensive and it's kind of similar to what we did before it's a bunch of marines you know taking the fight to the aliens yeah so the next screenplay that comes up is eric red who wrote the hitcher and near dark Mm -hmm. which are two films that i would comfortably put in my top 20 movies of all time i love near dark Love it. The Hitcher, maybe even top 10, uh, if you catch me on a good day. Damn, okay. I, I love that movie so much. All right. And his version is like basically, uh, I've read it. It's terrible. Oh. <laughs> it is full of typos. There's characters change names halfway through. Apparently, he was like given a very short amount of time to write this spec script. And his version is it's so funny because it takes also takes place on a space station that has been made to look like a small Midwestern town Okay, <laughs> on the inside. So there's literally like farms and cornfields. And I kind of just want to be like, Eric, like you can put a movie somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> they don't all have to be near dark. Yeah. 
But he also played with the idea of the xenomorphs becoming an airborne virus, yeah. which was like a xenomorph is killed and it starts to infect like the town's like livestock, which turn into monsters. And we sort of see a little bit of that in this movie. Yeah, not a fan. But he kept going even further where the the movie, his script ended with the entire space station turning into a giant xenomorph and then getting hit <laughs> oh with my nuclear god. missiles and oh my god. unfilmable. Also a a, a hilarious hilariously uh graphic sex scene that feels like something out of a friday the 13th movie in his screenplay um, this leads us to david tui the guy who brought us pitch black and mm-hmm. the chronicles of riddick and his screenplay uh you can see a lot of the dna of pitch black and it's a prison planet where prisoners are learning that every time one of them disappears in the night they're actually being used for experiments from the company mm-hmm. and it's more of like a jail break kind of script. I'm into that. Yeah, I like it. I think it could have been something very different, especially if they're like, we really want to do something a little more back to basics, keep the alien in the shadows yeah. and, you know, move away from established characters. The second most famous one, I think, is the one by Vincent Ward, which was a uh, took place on a planet made of wood. I heard about this. This sounds so fucking stupid to me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's an odd idea, right? Yeah. Like, it's the idea was that it was like this satellite that was reinforced by wood and steel and this monastic order like lives on this moon and has rejected all technology and uh, this was the first of the screenplays that ended with Ripley sacrificing herself to destroy the the final queen. Yeah. And uh, apparently Vincent Ward just sort of left the production. Oh, David Toohey left the production because he found out someone else had been hired to write another script and he's like, well, fuck you. If If I'm not the guy you're working with, I'm not the guy you're working with. Right. Vincent Ward was asked to make all these changes and he was like, no, I, I really like my idea. Yeah. And this, I think, leads us to the biggest issue is that the final screenplay was being written and rewritten as filming began. Mm-hmm. And the screenwriters were the producers. Yep. So no one was telling them shit. <laughs> my biggest question <laughs> about this whole production is, and it, it continues to this day. Yeah. Why the fuck do studios set release dates and then feel obligated to meet them? Right. It's all arbitrary. Like you were putting the handcuffs on your own wrists <laughs> and no one made you start shooting this this thing while the script was still being written. They were saying that David Fincher would film scenes and then like the next day found out those scenes had been scrapped. And so it was all for naught. I mean, look, this is the same questions I always have about just money in general. Yeah. I'm like, y'all uh, government, the government made up money. Yeah. You, what do you mean? The government is bankrupt. You guys <laughs> print it. I, I just, I, I, I understand from the fiscal aspects of it. Uh-huh. I'm like, well, we know in quarter three of 1992, we need to make X amount of money. Sure. We'll put the alien movie there. But I'm like, but you don't, you, you don't have to do that. And that's, <laughs> truly why this movie was made in the first place because Fox was like having a hard time and they were like well look we make an alien movie that's that's a guaranteed money maker that's uh-huh. the only that's where we go next and you know original and they and you can tell you know they originally wanted to have Ridley Scott come back to direct it and James Cameron they offered both of them right yep. and he was they neither of them wanted to because they wanted to shoot alien three and four back to back and both of them were like I I don't really make movies that way yeah. I, I work on them and until they're done, you know? Yeah. So they go to Rennie Harlan, oh, who you know, would go on to make Nightmare on Elm Street 4 and yep. Cliffhanger and yep. Deep Blue Sea, three classics. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, eventually they end up with David Fincher because they wanted someone who was, you know, happy for the work. Yep. And to this day, Fincher won't even give interviews about this movie. Yeah. He's like, no one hates this movie more than I do. So much so that he was not involved when the quadrilogy came out. He was yeah. the only one that said, I don't want to make a director's cut. <laughs> And sure. he gave what what his editor he gave them permission to do whatever they wanted yeah something like that yeah to, to sort of sort of just add in all the unused footage and recut the movie to like it's sort of original version but yeah he was basically like it's not really a director's cut because at no point was i making the movie i wanted to make right and he said you can call it whatever you want just don't call it a director's cut and that's why it's referred to as the assembly cut right which is apt because it seems to use the ethos of well we filmed it we might as well put it in there right. because the assembly cut is like two hours 30 and uh, it's too much alien three my guy (laughs) yeah i I mean my my overall view of this movie is i think 
David Fincher managed to, under impossible circumstances, yeah. still churn out something that is worth watching. Yeah. Like, it's unfortunate that that's how the movie got made. And I'm, it's upsetting that he dismisses this movie so hard. And I get it. I wouldn't want to be associated with it either. Yeah. But like, your next movie is seven. <laughs> like, you've automatically, you didn't even have to redeem yourself and you already did. Like, <laughs> well, it, but it also, I, I think that's also where the control freak mythology of Fincher comes from, right? Mm-hmm. Because he, this is his first movie and he essentially promises himself, I'm never compromising like that again. Yeah. You know, by the time he makes Panic Room, you know, Panic Room is infamous as being the first movie that was 100% pre vised before they even started shooting. Right. Like he was like, I, I storyboarded everything by computer. I know every shot. I planned every shot. There's no second unit on this fucking thing. Good. I'm shooting everything in this room. Good. Yeah. I, I think he only had like six weeks of pre-production for this one. That's not enough time. No. That's yeah. That's not enough time. And the scri- and he, he got to set realizing the script wasn't done. Yeah. And, you know, he, he ends up working with this crew of mostly, you know, British actors and, mm-hmm. and folks who had been in the business for a long time. I mean, Charles Dance had been acting for like 20 years at this point. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's working with Sigourney Weaver, who apparently really liked him, yeah. but had, was angry through the whole shoot. There's some really interesting stories from people who kind of caught her when she was at her most frustrated with the production. Yeah. Staunch defender of him. It's just not, it's not the way anyone wants to make a movie. Yeah. But it ends up turning out as uh, one of my favorite re- review quotes of all time. When Roger Ebert was talking about Alien Resurrection, he referred to Alien 3 as one of the best looking bad movies I've ever seen. He's not wrong. <laughs> no. He He's not wrong. Like, again, I think it's incredible the, the, like the results that David Fincher managed to get, even not even really having a say so in the edit. Right. Like, the fact that they had so much good stuff to work with is because of David Fincher. Right. Like, this movie does not deserve all the hate it gets. If anything deserves hate, it's the fucking producers in the <laughs> studio. It is not David Fincher. It's no. not Sigourney Weaver. It's not, not even the screenwriters to an extent, because yes, they were also the producers, but <laughs> they managed to turn, like, I guess my problem with this movie overall is I find it a little stagnant in parts because there's not really anywhere to go. Right. Like Alien, you were on the planet and you were on the ship and you were doing all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. Aliens is action packed. You're running around, gunning and shooting. The fact when they're like, oh, there's no guns on this planet. We're all men. <laughs> uh, the rescue team's coming and six weeks or whatever. And you're like, okay, well, <laughs> then I guess, like you said, we're going back to basics. But yes, we'll sit tight. Yeah. No, the thing that drives me wild about this movie is... We are, we have filled this film with unbelievable British character actors. Yep. We've got Ralph Brown, Brian Glover, Danny Webb, Pete Postlethwaite, like, mm-hmm. uh, unbelievable, like one of my favorites. And we have made all of them look exactly alike. So I have <laughs> it's no concept. To tell them apart. <laughs> there's a moment, I think it's just in the assembly cut, but there's a moment halfway through the movie where someone goes, Oh my God, I found Vincent. And I'm like, I don't fucking know who that is. Yeah, who the fuck is Vincent? <laughs> No, that's in the theatrical cut today, too, because I, when I saw it, I was like, who the fuck is that? I know who Charles has done is because he's the only man of color here. Right. <laughs> yeah. And also d- giving a unbelievable performance in this movie. Uh, he's great. He's so good. I think, by and large, the acting in this is really good. Yep. There's some really fantastic dialogue in here. Yep. But yeah, it it's one of those movies where I, I appreciate its parts more than the sum. Yeah. You know, I love the, the concept of giving us a new type of alien unfortunately the dragon looks like shit through most of the movie it looks like shit anytime the alien is cg and not a puppet it looks like shit so here's the crazy thing almost none of it is cg no they, it is a rod puppet that they have superimposed into the shot which oh is why God. it has that weird fucking halo over it yeah it's got the weird lighting effect yeah oh, that sucks i know especially because tom woodruff jr is doing some really great you know effects work in here yeah uh, it just just the the year before this or the year the same oh no the same year he does the effects for death becomes her which Mm. is like one of my another one of my favorite movies and he you know done all this stuff with zemeckis he comes into to alien and not only is he in the suit but he's building the the creature effects and i think he did some really really great work yeah that just uh, ends up looking really goofy in the final cut yeah i agree i just 
I don't know, I man. I, I find parts of this movie great, but yeah. also I'm like, it, it is, a, it, it's an obvious step down in quality from Alien and Aliens. Oh, and that's, totally. It's just unfortunate because, like, if those two hadn't come before, maybe this movie would have done way better. Like, if this was an original idea, mm-hmm. I don't know. But it's hard not to compare it to those other two. But it is still leaps and bounds better than most of the stuff that came after. <laughs> that is the funny thing, right? Like, just like Die Hard in a Blank became shorthand for a new action screenplay. Mm-hmm. I, how many Alien knockoffs have we seen? that are actually great Absolutely. you know and i think this yeah like you said if this a was couple, but that's it. I mean, just a few but <laughs> <laughs> but like uh, if if this was sold as you know it's it's like alien but on a prison planet yeah. you know maybe that's a that's a good time you're right uh well i got, I got a lot more to say but before we get there why don't we uh, give everyone a recap in case they need a refresher on uh some of the information regarding alien 3 yeah So as we mentioned before, the year is 1992. The director is, of course, the great David Fincher. Uh, the movie stars Sigourney Weaver, Charles S. Dutton, Charles Dance, and Lance Henriksen. Yeah. Had a budget of $50 million that I believe ballooned up to 65 by the time it was all said and done. Mm-hmm. There's a hilarious story I got to tell later on, too, about that. Okay. It managed to gross $160. $160. That's it. <laughs> $160 million worldwide. Yeah. Currently sits at what I feel is an undeserved, way too low, 47% on Rotten Tomatoes. Wow. And the movie was nominated for Best Visual Effects at the Academy Awards, which is insane to me. Yeah. And Best Special Effects at the BAFTAs. Must have been a slow year for visual effects in 1992. Well, I'm, I'm always so surprised by the the awards that this series has garnered. You know, yeah. like every time I remember that Sigourney Weaver was nominated for an Academy Award for Aliens is just blows my mind. Yeah. I love, I mean, I, she's great in that movie, but yeah. it always, you know, the Academy typically ignores genre film. Absolutely. And this is just this. And I think that's another thing is this series has carries an air of prestige. Mm-hmm. So when you get to Alien 3, which is just sort of like a down and dirty action horror movie, yeah. and I think people were disappointed by that. I, I want to say too, and to go back to that budget, mm-hmm. um, I don't know how true this is. It's just what I read today. I didn't. I wasn't able to find too many sources on it. But apparently, the movie had already finished wrapped, and they had to do some reshoots. David Fincher said, "I'm not doing any fucking reshoots." <laughs> yeah. Sigourney Weaver got paid five and a half million dollars just to star in this movie. Uh huh. And by the time they needed to do reshoots, because it took a year to edit this movie. Oh wow! I don't know if you saw that. No, because they were still scrambling. Like, oh, we were missing stuff and things like that. But yeah. they needed to go in to do reshoots. She had already grown her hair back out, and she's like, "I'm not cutting my." hair again oh, yes unless you pay me 40 grand yeah and they're like well we're not gonna pay you that we'll hire somebody to get to make you a bald cap and i can't remember the gentleman's name but they hired a guy who's like all right i'm gonna do this but i'm only gonna do it once uh-huh <laughs> that bald cap sixteen thousand dollars that's so funny they had to make it two more times for promotional <laughs> images and stuff like that I'm like you could have just paid her the fucking 40 grand uh-huh it's uh, just shooting themselves in the dick over and over again. It's That's incredible. Absolutely a, much of a failure the people making this movie were that were not the crew or cast. And, and, and you know, he, it's true. Fincher didn't want to do the reshoots, but they're the, the arguably the most iconic shot in yep. this entire franchise. The, the close was up. A shot he snuck in. Yeah. It was a <laughs> shot that he was like, fuck it. Sigourney, we're going to, I'm going to grab the puppet and we're going to make this happen. The, the shot of the, yeah, of the, of the creature getting right in her face. Mm-hmm. is like arguably i think the most famous shot of the series you're not wrong it's it's definitely up there um okay let's go back we're gonna watch the trailer for the movie mm-hmm. and uh we'll see how well they were able to market this uh frankenstein of a movie <laughs> <laughs> here in a world where the sun burns gold in a world <laughs> jesus the wind blows colder. A visitor has come. But not. Wow, already a lot of shots from the assembly cut. I was going to say, guys, I don't recognize half of this. That's the first shot that I recognize. Come on! The suspense is back. And we have no weapons of any kind? The fear is back. And most of all, it's a very orange movie. Uh huh. The bitch is back. The bitch is back. <laughs> wow. 
That's the shot. Alien 3. I'm of, I'm of two minds about this. Yeah. The first thing I'll say is I think you do need Sigourney back to close the chapter on her character. And this is a good way to end it. Sure. But I'm also, as much as I love Sigourney in these first two movies, and to an extent this one, I think this the series is beyond her. Like, you don't need Sigourney to come back for every single movie. Right. Like, the concept is so strong of this creature that you could just put it kind of anywhere. And I think that's what Ridley Scott realized when he made Prometheus and Covenant. And, mm-hmm. Like, the creature is kind of why we're here. Same with Predator. We don't need Schwarzenegger back in every Predator movie. <laughs> I agree to a certain extent. I think one of the things that's so fascinating to me about the Alien series is I love movies about the shitty future. Yeah, right? same. Like where everything is just functional. Like the you know the 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 ship on in the first movie is not like they're 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 just blue collar workers yep. in space. Yep. And I think the more that you learn about the company and the outside world, the the less interesting it is. Yeah. I love the idea that we don't even hear Waylon Utah out loud until this film i know and uh, i don't know i i think while it's interesting to put the alien in other locations and and peel back some of those layers i'm honestly more intrigued by the idea that this is just a regular person who has been dealing with this thing for too long now yeah that being said yeah ripley becomes a little detached a little too quickly for me in this movie a little bit yeah well, she's she's tired. Sure. She's fucking over the shit. Right. And she's got a monster in her stomach. We forgot to mention we're recording this on Sigourney Weaver's birthday. Bless. So glad you exist. There you go. You mentioned Waylon Utani. I have a question right off the bat. Sure. What the fuck kind of company is Waylon Utani where they can have a whole division set for space mining and exploration uh-huh. and also have their own prisons? Are they the f- what are they, the fucking bick of the future? That Why is, are they- <laughs> that is it that is a note that I wrote down because I, I had never for some reason I had never picked up on it before this watch where Clemens says yeah we're on one of Wayland yutani's prison planets mm-hmm. and, I, and I just could not yeah it, it's it, we're in a future where corporations have their own privatized military and yeah I, I I think that's fascinating we're not we're almost there sure we're speed running towards it <laughs> well we're, all, we're 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 playing in in Blade Runner yeah. concepts as well right mm-hmm I have another question too. Yeah. When did we start referring to the alien as the xenomorph? Because I thought it was the original. No. But I mean, maybe not in the movie, but I thought Ridley Scott referred to it as such because in these opening credits, we're still saying the alien design by blah, 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 blah. I know. You know, I thought that was interesting. I guess it's not common nomenclature. It's called the xenomorph in H.R. Giger's original paintings, mm. I think, okay. in, in his in his original concept art. But yeah, I, I'm trying to remember when it's said on screen for the first time because it, it's it's very funny that when she just goes like, actually, it's a xenomorph. Like yeah. She says it in this movie. Yeah. Yeah, I that that is fascinating. I think it is funny that it is well he's also so they they say alien effect in the opening credits yeah. and then in the closing credits the alien is credited as the dragon. Yeah, which is odd. I love. It's an odd choice. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Speaking of odd choices that I think pay off, I love the 20th century fanfare here where oh just, my gosh. the last note gets real eerie. Turns into a sting. Uh-huh. It's good. Yeah, I think this whole opening is solid. I, I do. I lo- as much as I disagree with, you know, killing off these characters yep. uh, immediately, I I love the quick cuts. I love the model work. Mm-hmm. The shot of just the blood spreading on the cloth is yes. really great. Yeah, it's great. And the glass cracking on the tears. I think this movie starts, it's a great inciting incident. It's right away. Right. It puts you in a very energetic state like we're, we're getting right to it and then we slow it down <laughs> <laughs> right but less great is the you know that it's also a perfect representation of this movie right like it it's really well shot but then we have the one shot of the clearly styrofoam floor that yep. they're dropping uh acid onto yep and i think one of the best shots of this movie is a is a kind of a nothing shot but it is incredibly creepy it's the dog barking and then the cut to the slow push in on the face hugger sitting on the ceiling. Yes. That is awesome. <laughs> Crawling its way out. That is, well, he's just kind of sitting there, like, right. almost like tapping his hands on a desk. Uh, <laughs> and, and not in the assembly cut. They, they find Ripley washed up on the beach. Yeah, it's, it is weird because in the theatrical, she crashes into the ocean. And right. then, like, the next shot is them, like, pulling around. I'm like, wait a minute, you guys are just in the middle of the water? What is happening? Right. Also, the alien doesn't come out of a dog, it comes out of an ox yeah, in the assembly I heard cut, about which, that. Is, uh, yeah. which is very interesting. But the yeah i i love all of this stuff i do think it's really funny that the 
pod gets progressively more put together as the movie goes along. Like mm-hmm. it is, it's totally fucked when they pick it up. And then by the halfway point, she's like, well, I can also use the scanner. Yeah. I can also plug Bishop up to it. And then it's fully <laughs> functional by the end. Right. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> All right, so we should set up the premise of this movie. Sure. So after the events of Aliens, you know, Newt and Hicks and Bishop and uh, Ripley are- Oh, my. Oh, my. And uh, I guess something failed in their escape pod, Mm -hmm. and it caused a whole bunch of havoc. They were told that Newt drowned when her cryotube flooded. Uh Uh-huh. Hicks gets impaled by some debris during the uh, the crash. Bishop gets torn apart similarly, and Sigourney survives. But they crash land on this prison planet, as we're calling it, that is abandoned minus 25 people that have voluntarily decided to stay behind on it. Yeah, they were, they were basically being used as prison labor. Yeah. And then they all, they're all murderers and... Uh-huh. and awful people who have supposedly found religion and inner peace. This is the weird part. Yeah. <laughs> and told the company they wanted to stay behind. So yeah. so I just want to talk to whoever's decision it was to make the follow-up to two of the most successful sci-fi horror movies of all time with one about a planet run by incels. <laughs> like, <laughs> sure. These guys have all said they've devoted a vow of celibacy. Mm-hmm. Like, the fact that Ripley is even there gets him in an uproar. I'm like, these guys are just a bunch of Mike Pence's. Like, we can't even be in the same room as a woman because of our faith. Yeah, mother wouldn't approve. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, what the fuck is... What do you talk... Pick one or the other. Like, right. if they're just a bunch of prisoners that are there, fine. But if they're a cult, that's a different story. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I found it very odd to have both of those in the movie. No, I agree. And it's also, it makes it difficult to root for any of them yeah, or, or care yeah. when they die. Yeah. Aside from, you know, I mean, even Dutton tells us, like Charles S. Dutton tells us uh, that he's a, he's one of them, he's a murderer, but we also see that he's, you know, found God. And what does she say? Found God at the ass end of space and yeah. he's trying to become a better person. But even he has his like terrifying moments. Well, he, he, when she tries to uh, approach him, in the in the mess hall he says i'm a murderer and racist of women and she goes really <laughs> oh he does say that you're right it is you're right like it's hard to cheer like the only people i'm rooting for is charles dance and ripley and then charles dance is dispatched way too early yeah, so. Cle- yeah charles dance as clemens who you know is not a bad person but did accidentally murder a this bunch of children <laughs> this is insane so he's basically mr gower from the drugstore and it's a wonderful life <laughs> They're all on this planet because, like Nathan said, they're a bunch of rapists or murderers. Charles Dance was a... They, he, he tells her backstory right before he dies that <laughs> yeah. he was fresh out of med school and he had worked... He was working in the ER for 36 hours straight and he had been, become addicted to morphine. It and during, like, when, when he got off his 36-hour shift... He decided to go put a few back because he des- he earned it. Yeah. And while he was out getting drunk, they called him back in and he inadvertently killed, what, 11 people by accidentally prescribing the wrong dosage of a painkiller. Painkillers. And I'm yeah. like, I don't think you deserve seven years jail time for that. Well. If I'm being honest. Yeah. You know, a bunch of people, a bunch of people died. Yeah, a bunch of people died, but I don't think that's necessarily his fault. Sure. I think when you put someone on a 36 hour shift, especially someone who's fresh out of med school, right? And you're like, no, come back. We need you. Now prescribe some dosages of these painkillers. Like, that's on you guys. You know what really shows you how bleak the future is? Is that he was sent to prison, but his license wasn't entirely revoked either. I know, it, was it was just, just downgraded. downgraded. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you why it's such a bleak future. It's the year 2179, and we're still using bulk bone saws during <laughs> autopsies i thought that was weird oh my gosh that autopsy scene is awful we don't you, we get very little graphic uh imagery of it in the theatrical cut mm-hmm. i know in the assembly cut you get a lot more but a little bit, yeah so charles dance is the one that kind of like takes a liking to ripley and like tries to keep her safe uh-huh. he says they're all bald by the way and he says oh we have a big problem with lice here and i'm like you're all you're how you're all fucking bald and i'm like Maybe he means pubic lice. Maybe <laughs> he says, well, he tells her, he's like, you really should let me shave your head yeah. and then I'll give you the room so you can take care of everything else. Yeah. And I think they shave so that they don't get the lice. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's not a, uh, it's reactionary, not uh, <laughs> right. a precaution. I just thought that was fun. <laughs> it is funny. I do love, uh, this is also where we're introduced to Brian Glover as the warden, mm-hmm. warden Andrews, who has the most unbelievable <laughs> voice. I was going to say, with the, I could not take, I could not follow in the suit's footsteps with that. That voice it's just so fucking funny <laughs> rumor report <laughs> <laughs> he's like here's the tea yeah. <laughs> no tea no shade there's a woman on the planet 
<laughs> yeah, 85. Did you recognize 85? <laughs> no. He's he plays Oh, let me look up the character's name. He was Del Preston in Wayne's World 2, the oh world, my god. the greatest roadie of all time. Yes. Oh my god. This is why Keith Richards cannot be killed by conventional <laughs> weapons. <laughs> So, 85, who we find out at the end of the movie, is called that because one of the other prisoners says, oh, we looked at his personnel file when he got here. That's his IQ. And I'm like, that doesn't seem right. Well, and so, here's the fucked up thing. So, Ralph Brown, his blog is still up on the internet from where he talks about his experience filming Alien 3. Oh, wow. And talks about how, what a stressful experience it was. How, like, he was paranoid the whole time that he was going to get fired. And, but he also, he's like, I signed on to play this character who was described as sort of like a yuppie like you know trying to fall in line but then eventually does the right thing yeah and he said as production went along like he said i my death changed like five times like uh-huh. i get my throat slit by Gallic, then i get killed by the dragon then i end up like trying to use someone as bait and i'm a turncoat and i'm a coward and so he eventually goes to talk to walter hill the producer slash screenwriter and it's just like, well, I just want to make sure that I'm like playing the character that I wanted to play. Right. And Hill essentially says something to the effect of like, well, Ralph, we're all making sacrifices on this picture. Oh you know, God. we got to work together. And Ralph Brown says, he's like, okay, I'll, I'll, you know, we'll talk about it or whatever. And he says like a couple days later is when he gets the screenplay, the, the pages that now reveal that his character is like mentally deficient. Uh-huh. And he's, <laughs> it's like, you can't just say that it was revenge because you you know had problems with the script but uh-huh. it sure feels that way it's just a weird choice because i'm like 85 is this iq that's that doesn't seem right you, you also <laughs> you don't get that from any of his dialogue no either. he seems I mean, fine he he's the one who's operating the computer to yeah. send all the messages to the company isn't he like the number two he is like i, I don't know i don't know it's, it's i mean there are there are all the jokes where he's constantly repeating like whatever the warden has just said but yeah, like once the warden's fine. dead he's kind of his own character yeah i don't know i thought that was a weird choice he does have one of my favorite moments in the movie which is when ripley is just like none of us are leaving this planet we have to kill ourselves Mm -hmm. and the alien Mm -hmm. and he just kind of looks at her for a second and goes fuck you yeah (laughs) i I like it was funny he's like i've got a wife i've got a kids i'm like then why the fuck did you and volunteer to stay behind on this prison plane <laughs> right <laughs> yeah I don't, the, the voluntary thing makes this way weirder than i feel like it's supposed to be it seems that aaron and and the warden are the only two on the planet who weren't actually prisoners right yeah i don't, I don't know i feel like make it one or the other make uh-huh. it we are stuck here for a life sentence sure. and they were here and they just come back every few months to like put us in order and everything but to be like no everyone else left and we decided to stay behind that's aw- especially if a guy who's like i got wife and kids it doesn't make any sense yeah it's it, you can tell it's a leftover bit from the vincent ward screenplay where uh-huh. these people all took a vow yeah. you know and they're actually monks yeah it doesn't make a whole lot of sense but charles dance i mentioned earlier i think he is so so good in this movie i think he's he is so good he's so good at being nurturing while also being monotone like i feel like that's two clashing tones but yeah. he manages to pull it off and i'm upset when he goes <laughs> yeah there's a warmth to him even as he's given yeah like you said he's giving this very withholding performance at the same time like, like if he had the way he tells ripley that uh, you know new and hicks are dead like mm-hmm. i i wouldn't mind charles dance telling me my family died and yeah. if he did it the way he tells ripley because it's so like Oh, okay, thank you, Charles Dance, for telling me. <laughs> like, <laughs> he, he's like, oh, she she drowned. I'm so sorry. I'm like, oh, it's okay. <laughs> well, I also, we get a reminder that, you know, Ripley was frozen for 200 years yeah. because she, she says we have to check them for cholera. And he just very calmly tells her, there hasn't been a reported case of cholera in over 200 years. Yeah. And I, and I think, I think he's, he's so great. Speaking of which, did you play the game Alien Isolation? I sure did. Dude. It's great. Oh, uh, it is. I would love, I mean, it's, it's great as it is. I would love to see that adapted too, because yeah. what a companion that would be. I will go as far as to say that it might be the best video, f- film inspired video game of all time. Like yes. it is, it's up there. <laughs> 
Like if you turn, if you take a like products of the Alien franchise, mm-hmm. it might be in the top three. Like genuinely. Which, by the way, did you read the stuff about how this movie was supposed to launch a toy line in a Saturday morning cartoon series? How? How the fuck are you going to do that with a bunch of? <laughs> Mr. Murderers, what the fuck are you talking about? It's, I mean, this is this is the era of RoboCop and yeah, Rambo getting that's cartoons. True, that's we, true. We talked about my pitch for the thing, the animated series. <laughs> uh-huh. But like, yeah, this was supposed to launch a series called Operation Alien Ugh. that would have had uh, Hicks as the main character. Wild, and uh, that's like when all those toys were coming out in the '90s, based on the Alien franchise. They were basically well, we had all these designs and prototypes left over. No cartoon series, Jesus, but. Hey, kids love R-rated movies, right? <laughs> R-rated movies about creatures with phallic imagery <laughs> that is all designed about impregnating humans as incubators <laughs> that rip out of their chest. Yeah, that's a great idea for a kid's cartoon. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Insane. I got a question for you. Why doesn't Ripley tell them about the Xenomorph? Truly don't know. Yeah. I, I, I think maybe because she thinks they're not going to believe her because she had to go through all of this shit last time too. I guess. But yeah, it's it's odd, right? Like, yeah. I don't know if it's me and I've just gotten off the, the Sulaco and I'm, <laughs> you know, a, a, asleep. Yeah. I wake up and I'm like, fuck, I just, th- that fight was five minutes ago for her. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I, I, I would run head first back out to that beach and just drop, like, stick my head in the water. I'm not right. dealing with this shit again. I can't. <laughs> if I wake up after dealing with the events of Alien and Aliens to a Enzo planet with a bunch of murders and <laughs> A bunch of fucking... <laughs> yeah. I'm going in. Shoot me into space. Absolutely. <laughs> So, yeah, they they uh, tell her that uh, Newt and Hicks and Bishop are all dead. And yeah. she's fearful that an alien got into the ship, a face hugger. Right. And so, they do an autopsy on Newt and they check uh, Hicks. And she's like, we got to burn the bodies. And they're all like, well, what the fuck for? And uh. she uses the Claria thing as like a reasoning. Uh-huh. And uh, they have this funeral. And I thought it was so funny because the, the warden's giving like this eulogy and everything. And it's fine. And then Charles as Dutton steps in out of nowhere and goes, why are the innocent punished? And I'm like, dude, it's. <laughs> The cremation relax like if we don't need two speeches going on at this funeral <laughs> oh then yeah the assembly cut charles s dutton has like five sermons oh like my God. almost every scene begins with him just like ruminating on the nature of good and evil oh jesus it's it's a good performance i'm just i'm glad the theatrical tones down much more than what it sounds like it is in the assembly cut, yeah a little of him could go a long way that's also left over from a version of the screenplay where uh, what is his character's name um, uh, i couldn't tell you uh dylan mm. dylan is like worshipped as a like a god uh by the other <laughs> dylan prisoners. the god <laughs> dylan the god <laughs> i know you had an ox in your version but how do we feel about the alien dog uh i don't mind it i i don't think it really has a huge uh impact on it's it's weird to me that like because the idea here is uh, kind of held over from other scripts where they oh if it pops out of a you know a different species it kind of takes on elements of like their body Mm -hmm. and their abilities or whatever so Mm -hmm. i but i you know i don't draw a direct line between dog and ox and well i'm in the vents now (laughs) um but uh i i I don't mind it i wished it looked better yeah um, but i think this this sequence where we're cross-cutting between the funeral and the gory birth of this alien are are pretty well done yeah i i think the idea is okay i just wish they would have treated him kind of more like bruce the shark where like less is more don't show it so much i agree keep him in the shadows very brief glimpses like right when he attacks when he attacks charles dance in in the infirmary Mm -hmm. you get very brief glimpses of it and that that rules yeah i'll even take the the iconic shot of him up close with ripley but like that's as much as i need to see of this thing right the scariest moments in this movie are like when she's in the basement Mm -hmm. and it's you know tucked itself underneath one of the pipes or you see it sort of blurry in the background behind morse at Mm -hmm. one point like that stuff is really effective that's good and then even when this guy finds it thinking it's his dog in the fan scene like it's just yeah incubating there you just sort of make out yeah right you can see like it's it's tail and it's sort of slithering around but you don't you feel like you're seeing something you're not supposed to right yeah like you're almost being a voyeur to this creature (laughs) right it's like when it's like looking into a hole in the ground and seeing a snake you know a a hive or or, you know whatever a snake nest or like uh like you're pulled up like an old stone in the yard and there's just a bunch of like uh worms and stuff under it 
Like, Absolutely. Yeah, I feel like I'm not. I caught them off guard, and <laughs> this is a private moment. Sorry, <laughs> fellas. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't mind the doggy that. Yeah, I just wish it looked better. Yeah, I did the count. 31 minutes in this movie before we get a xenomorph attack. Wow. But, and that's just the theatrical. I, I don't know what it is for the assembly, but. The first three are, are real slow burns. Yeah. Like, uh, the, you know, and I kind of I kind of love that about them, that restraint. I do too, but I also like that this first death is not even a direct death from the xenomorph. It just oh, scares sure. this guy. And he falls into these giant spinning fans. And I just. <laughs> and he splatters <laughs> yeah. all over the place. Yeah. yeah. And maybe they hired the paramedics from Hot Rod for this one scene because <laughs> they get on the intercom and one of them says, one of our prisoners has been diced <laughs> like, that's very insensitive like, and well in the in you know brian, <laughs> brian glover the the warden tells clemens like the problem here is that we're letting this lady walk around yeah. and these kind of accidents happen when yeah when your men walk around <laughs> with a hard on uh-huh yeah, they get blown into, and I like their excuse. They're like, "What happened?" Ah, it was a gust of wind blew him into the fucking fans that have no protective grip. Why was this guy there? I don't know. I guess looking for his dog, right? Well, he was he was sweeping. No, that's not even that guy. That's not even the guy. Right? Right? I don't know. I don't. This is the problem. Is they all look exactly the they same. do. They all look exactly. And in fact, to the point where they're like, "Oh, who who died?" And he's and Charles Ann's like, "Oh, I think it's Murphy." And he's like, "How the fuck can you tell?" And I'm like, "Yeah, how can he tell?" Right? And he goes, "Oh, because." Because that's his boots. And I'm like, you all have the same outfit on. What the fuck are you talking about? Not that I have a problem with the actors in this movie, but like we needed some like when you see Lance Henriksen, you know that that's that motherfucker right away, right? Because like, he's got fucking hair for one. Well, that, but he also is just like a, he's a striking looking dude. Yeah. Like there's no yeah. one else on the planet who looks like Lance Henriksen. I don't, I don't, I don't know why you make them all white guys too, other than fucking Charles S. Dutton. Like right. get, get some diversity in there. Paul McGann truly is one of my favorite actors. Uh, and I did not recognize him mm-hmm. until he disappeared from the movie. It's and I was crazy. like, oh, right. Because he he shows up again in the assembly cut and has way more to do. Yeah. But he just it's it was so weird. It's crazy. The, we we get the this the scene where uh, the warden and Charles Dance and Ripley are all talking together, and he's mm-hmm. like, well, "Why did you let her out of the infirmary?" And I'm like, "This is kind of a good point. Yes, like not for not not to play into his idea of like, oh, we don't want him around, we don't want her around the men because it could rile things up. But it's also like this is a person that crash landed on your on your prison planet, right? Why don't you put her in quarantine uh, until the rescue team gets there? She crash landed and immediately started raving about there might have been a virus on board. Uh-huh. And yeah, and even outside of like, even outside of his weird stuff about you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna make the men uncomfortable. What about the fact that like, yeah, don't let her want because we see what happens when she is not doesn't have protection around her, right? Yep. Like these guys attack her and attempted re- scene, yeah, a scene that I do not need in this movie, I, uh, I especially fully for characters agree. I'm supposed to be rooting for to win at the end. Well, and here's the fucked up thing in the the guy who like with the Riddick goggles, mm-hmm. uh, Junior, a- according to IMDb, is what his character is named. Sure, he shows up again in the assembly cut and like helps her escape. Like he he has they try to give him like a a, a hero moment, like a Ugh. redemption moment, and I'm like, sorry, I'm not I'm not buying it. I'm glad he's fucking dead. I know <laughs> like, most of these people, I'm glad they're fucking dead. They give Charles S. Dutton a good redemption arc and everything, but yeah. like most of these characters, no, P- put them in the dirt. I don't <laughs> care. Which is probably one of the big problems that people have with this movie is there's no one to really root for other right. than Ripley and other than Ripley and Ripley actively wants to die yeah she keeps telling her I'm, i gotta kill myself well there's that bit where she she like like you said she gets uh she goes to lunch and sits down with the the men after being told like you shouldn't do that yeah and antagonizes them she's trying to get them to fight her yeah 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 i don't know her motivation in, in that in those moments i find bizarre but right. We also get this scene where uh, there these people are in this. Uh, ba- well, I guess there is another character of color because, but he dies really early on in the movie. I forgot about him. Uh-huh. But they're down in the basement. These candles get blown out or whatever, and they start looking around. And they find the xenomorph. Oh and right! I don't know. I wish I could see what this what he was doing to this guy because it's so fucking hard to see. But it looks like he's eating him. Is that true? Yeah, it's also just sort of like out of focus, and yeah, it, it's it is hard to tell. But you're right. There we do meet Leon Herbert, who has. He has one of those Matt Berry kind of voices where, like, it sounds like he's being dubbed in real time. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh-huh. this, yeah, but this is my note. Like you said, we cut to a bunch of people we've never seen before working on measuring each compartment. Yeah. Like, I'm not even sure what their job is. The editing in this chase That's is a good question. What are they doing? <laughs> right. Like, what? 
Well, if they're on a prison planet and it, they're, they volunteer to stay behind, this place got abandoned. Right. And they're like, oh, we have to send reports in. I'm like, for fucking what? Yeah. You chose to... What are you talking about? <laughs> Literally, he says, like, we got to find... We got to figure out the measurements of this compartment. And then we're told that they keep the foundry burning, but it's not clear what they're making there. Other yeah. than... I, I I think we're in the... Uh, we're, we're in the factory from Cobra where they just make lava. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just make lava. <laughs> I, I don't understand... The, di- the dynamics either of the roles there because yes there's a warden but there's no guards right everyone's kind of voluntarily just doing whatever and even if there wasn't a, a, a warden they can't escape they say multiple times nothing on this planet works right they send a, a supply ship in every six months they're just staying there for whatever reason but they're still like oh we got to do work we got to send reports in no the fuck you don't <laughs> I don't know I found it very bizarre yeah and the whole time I'm watching this movie by the way I should mention uh-huh. I just remember at one point John John Carpenter pitched that he wanted to make a Dead Space movie. Oh, right. And they wouldn't let him do it. And I'm like, you have robbed us of what potentially one of the greatest fucking sci-fi horror movies alongside Alien. He's still saying he wants to do it. Like, let when the, man the Dead it. Space remake came out, he was yeah. like, boy, I sure wish someone would give me, like, $50 million. Let and him I'm like, do boy, it. you don't even know how much movies cost now. He can do it. I know. He can do it. $50 million? He could get that movie made for 20 Oh, I, I believe I, I it. I guarantee you he could make a Dead Space movie for 20 million. True. Let him do it. We we are being robbed of time. We don't have much time left with John Carpenter. Let him fucking do it. I just I I cannot believe they have not capitalized on that. Like make you can you imagine an Event Horizon movie, oh but like gosh. a really good version of it, right? Like, I don't know. I, I I can't believe we haven't gotten it yet. Yeah, it's called Ghosts of Mars. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> a movie that I, I told my girlfriend about last night, and she wasn't sure if it was a bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the one with Ice Ice Cube, right? Ice Cube and Jason Statham. Yeah, I wouldn't believe you either if I didn't know it was a real movie. So... <laughs> So we get Charles Dance's backstory. They're in the infirmary, uh-huh. and it's it's kind of become known as a trope. Like I don't watch the show anymore, but when I watched The Walking Dead, right, anytime they were going to kill a character off that episode beforehand, they would open up to you. Yeah, they would be like, "Oh, here, let me tell you my whole life story," and they're murdered. Yeah. So like they do that here. You know, when I was a boy, blah 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 blah. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. The the cold open would be a flashback to them and the, before the pandemic and all that good stuff. Sure. So like, and then look at the flowers. <laughs> yeah, look at the flowers. <laughs> and so the xenomorph. It's so stealthy here. He sneaks into this room, yeah. murders Charles Dance with the cool... Anytime the, the xenomorph uses its little mouth and punches a hole in someone's head, I'm fucking here for it. It's rad. It's so cool. I also love that the xenomorph pulls a Michael Myers move and like goes through like the curtain. Mm-hmm. Like He, he mm-hmm. goes through the trouble of opening the curtain to attack him. And, and then, like you said, one of the most infamous shots from this whole series, uh. the xenomorph poking its head right up next to Ripley and menacing her yeah 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 it's great because at this point you don't know why it doesn't kill her but i'm also questioning why doesn't it kill the guy that's in the bed right that's just sitting there <laughs> and maybe one of the funniest shots uh-huh. is the xenomorph dragging charles dance's body like through the vent <laughs> oh i love it <laughs> like it's a quick it's a quick shot. it's good yeah and that's that's the stuff that works for me is when it's like sort of in the background or out of focus or whatever yeah. it's when it it's when we're getting the the really rough rotoscoping stuff it's not great yeah yeah but the uh well the, the you mentioned uh Gallic, the the Paul McGann's character who yeah. comes in here raving about the dragon. They they really don't touch on this at all in the theatrical version, but in the assembly cut, we get a little bit more of the idea that he, when he was first sentenced, he was almost nonverbal, completely insane, and he's sort of become a little bit re- rehabilitated while he's there. Mm-hmm. And encountering the alien just completely broke him. Yeah. There's a really great bit where after Boggs and the others are, are killed, they find him, at the, when they bring him, before they bring him into the infirmary, they find him in the kitchen eating a bowl of cereal and covered in blood. Ooh. Like, he's just, he's like, st- it's, it's a really good bit. But this is where the movie really diverges because in the theatrical cut, Gallic just kind of never shows up again. So you can assume maybe he got set on fire, <laughs> that big explosion. Oh my God. Oh, we got to talk about that scene. Holy Absolutely. shit. <laughs> but he, in, in the in the assembly cut, they actually managed to briefly trap the xenomorph, but he's become convinced the xenomorph is like a godly being. Yeah. And so he lets it loose and it kills him uh, at that point. It It's kind of a nice character moment for him, but it really just sort of makes the movie feel a little more repetitive 
repetitive because yeah. like you know we've we've locked it up now we're releasing it now we're doing you know the same now we gotta come up with a plan again yeah yeah and so this is where the warden gathers everybody around and he's it's it's spilling the tea time again <laughs> sure and as Ruma he's, control. Mm-hmm, as he's telling uh, all the rest of the prisoners what happened to Charles Dance and all the others, he gets pulled up into the vents by the Xenomorph. Yeah. One of the guys just screams, fuck, which is really good. And that then, made me laugh so hard <laughs> when, when the when the warden's stress ball falls from the ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> he just yells, fuck. It's so good. Well, well, the next shot is what made me laugh. Maybe the funniest part of the movie. It's it cuts to like a little bit later in time, and there's a guy mopping the blood off the floor, but also like <laughs> like he keeps, he keeps looking staring up, up a little bit and like ducking down. It's so fucking funny. <laughs> it's it's so funny, and it's uh, it. But that's the thing is like I I really enjoy that moment. But then I think this is meant to be a like hardcore horror action movie, right? Yeah. So what what are we doing? I don't know. I don't know. Um. And so they're like, okay, well, we don't have the ward anymore. We don't have Charles Dance. We need a leader. Yeah. And then I found this weird, too. They're always talking about, oh, Ripley's dealt with this before she should deal with it. And someone says, oh, you're going to stick up for Shirley Temple over here? I'm like, we're still referencing Shirley Temple in 20... 20- <laughs> we're not even referencing Shirley Temple now anymore. <laughs> right. What are you talking about? I just like, I think it's funny that in the future, the dystopian future, somehow Shirley Temple of all things survived culturally. Like, <laughs> it's like that. It's that thing Paul F. Tompkins was talking about with the when Star Trek has to reference real, you know, scientists. Yep. They always make up. They're like, it could be the greatest uh, thing since Thomas Edison or Albert Einstein or Glabglorb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. They always have to throw in one fake one. Absolutely. Then we get this, the plot. They're going to use this highly combustible chemical and they're going to set a trap for the xenomorph. Mm-hmm. And then this fails spectacularly <laughs> because yeah, they blow themselves the fuck up. The, the scene of the guy dropping the flare and setting everything on fire uh-huh. is, it's insane. It's so cool. It is. The super, super slow mo of this flare dropping and igniting this thing. Yeah. It says like half the remaining uh, cast of characters on fire. It does. It does. Yeah. We, we get rid of the rest of the nameless folks yeah. like immediately. Yeah. And this is where uh, Ripley is like, oh, I'm not feeling well. I need. I can now use that pod that has been magically repairing itself throughout the duration of the movie. Yeah. We've got the bishop scene. Yeah, I love the bishop scene. Yeah. I think the effect is really good of the, the, the animatronic head. And I think Henriksen's voiceover is haunting. Yeah, it's really good. It's very dark here, Ripley. I'm not what I used to be. I'd rather be nothing. Like, I... Oof. Yeah, please... I'm, I I hurt or something like that. Like yeah. My legs hurt or something like that. And I I wrote down, I've never heard an android have a death rattle before. Like I that, know. Like the sound he makes when he shuts down is upsetting. Yeah. It's, so we should explain. So she goes back to the pod. She, she has a feeling that something caused the crash that wasn't just a mechanical failure. Uh-huh. And she boots up Bishop and like, well, his head basically like uh, Ash in the original. Yeah. And he explains, yes, there was an alien on board. It may have laid its eggs in, in one of you. And so later on during the movie here, it's almost reminiscent of the scene in Prometheus where yeah. Ripley goes to this med bay and has them do a uh, ultrasound on her. Yeah. And turns out the face hugger did implant an embryo in her stomach. So she is, she's got a baby cooking in her. And I just, <laughs> as I'm watching this, by the way, Priscilla's watching this with me. She, she just goes in a Randy Newman voice, you've got an egg in you. <laughs> I fucking oh, no. lose my God. mind. <laughs> I lost my fucking mind. <laughs> I do. It is funny, though, that Ripley is able to immediately put together, oh, this is a queen. Yep. I guess she's able to see kind of the shape of the head, but she's become an expert. I can't see fucking anything in that ultrasound, by the way. No. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I, agree. She's she's dealt with this enough time. She, is the, she knows exactly the queen when she sees it. So I got to ask you, too, then, because she realizes this and puts the two and two together, that's why the Xenomorph didn't attack her earlier. Uh-huh. How do you feel about the idea that Ripley can kind of walk amongst uh, the aliens because she's impregnant? <sighs> by one i like the idea i don't think they do enough with it though yep that's how i feel about it i i think uh, you know it, it, it's funny i was thinking about this because we we did exorcist three earlier this season and there's that great there's that weird moment where we see george c scott say i'm gonna go visit the prisoner and then we cut to him backing out of the room yep. like shocked we basically get that here where yep. this alien drops down in front of her and then it cuts to her saying to dylan like it wouldn't attack me yeah like i i need i need a little bit more of that and i need 
I don't feel like it comes into play quite as much in the finale. Like they, they seem to think that that's what they're doing, but it's not very clear. I don't know. Yeah. The, the, the plot to get rid of the alien is a bit muddled here and a bit confusing, mm-hmm. but it's also perfectly apt because they're using a maze to do it. Right. So the plan is mm-hmm. they're in this uh, factory. That's this furnace, basically. Yeah. They're down in the basements and they're going to lower the xenomorph to this factory and pour molten lead on it. Yeah, close off the halls so that yeah. it just gets flooded with hot lead. So it gets funneled into it, right. And so, as they're doing this, again, it helps to make these characters separate, but <laughs> they're all luring it in and then shutting doors behind it, mm-hmm. and then eat, almost each one of them puts their fucking face up to the little window <laughs> in the door, and I'm like, stop fucking doing that! And one of them almost gets got when the Xenomorph punches through it. Well, and these guys also immediately lose their cool. Like, yeah. the second... They- it's anywhere near them. Everyone starts going like, go, go left. Oh, I meant right. I mean, to be fair, I would be shitting my pants. No, I, I, I totally <laughs> it get it. It would be an outbreak of cholera, by the way, <laughs> if I was there. And I would be this, the one dude with the fucking steak knife yep. who thinks I'm going to do something. Yep. But this, the, the problem with this stuff is it gets too repetitive and it's too difficult to keep track of what is going on because I there's agree. so many POV shots of the Xenomorph running and the, it, the camera's upside down and right. doors are shutting and I don't know where anyone is at any given time. Plus, they all look alike. And like, we know that we can differentiate these people because think about the Marines and aliens. Yeah. Those guys are all wearing the same clunky outfits yep. and, and helmets. But I, I know, I know who each of the, I know who Vasquez is. I yep. know who Hicks is mm-hmm. i don't i don't know but they all decide yeah we should have mentioned they all kind of decide yeah we're gonna we're all gonna die here basically we're gonna yeah. go to hell tonight so <laughs> they ended up getting the alien to funnel in and i thought i thought what they were gonna do is because the alien won't attack ripley that she could just lure it in like that was the like, plan and for some reason it doesn't start following her until dylan pretends he's gonna hurt her right like yeah. he picks her up which i think that's that's an interesting idea but then yeah i don't i don't know it for a lot of it it's just people kind of yelling come over here ugly yeah and then the alien not coming over there yeah there's a whole <laughs> like 10 minutes uh, you know, it feels like 10 minutes of ripley just like smacking at a corner and yeah. saying get out of there yeah. Come on. yeah it's like trying to shoo a bat out of your house because it accidentally <laughs> flew in. It's so stupid. Sure, she might as well have had like a space broom. Yeah, a space broom just paw- pawing at it. <laughs> but they do get into the, the furnace mm-hmm. and they they uh, they lure it in and Charles S. Dutton is has decided I'm not going to let you kill yourself, Ripley, until I know this thing is fucking dead. Yeah. And so it lures it into this l- empty dead end hallway. They pour <laughs> Jesus Christ, this is awful. Uh, they pour her reaction when she realizes Dylan is gonna die yeah. is heartbreaking. Like she's so great. The Xenomorph is on top of him attacking him and he's just screaming at this thing. Is that all you fucking got? Yeah. <laughs> and they pour molten lead on top of it. Oh, and basically burn slash drown it. And then as they're kind of celebrating her and Morse, it leaps out of this lead. They turn on sprinklers and this thing shatters into a million pieces. Yeah. But I found this hilarious because I don't know if you read this too, but I read that they had to change the original ending they had at the very last minute because it was too similar to T2's ending. But in and its- then they accidentally made it more like yeah, T2. I was going to say, and it's current say, it's way too similar. They're yeah. in a refinery. There's a form of water slash ice that makes the villain and explode yeah. one of the heroes one of the heroes has to kill themselves by jumping into liquid magma yes. like it's, it's way too way too similar <laughs> it's wild how close they are yeah but and it does feel like the lead pouring down just feels a little anticlimactic over like there's it, it's not shot particularly well it's no. the one part of the movie that i find like a little puzzling like there's just like a weird close-up shot of pipes while triumphant music plays yeah but i'm not meant i don't know what i'm meant to be focusing on here yeah i know meanwhile while we get such a great intro yes. to the company and Bishop 2. Like, we get these sort of, like, establishing shots of this ship landing. Yeah, the rescue team is finally coming in. Yeah, and I love that that shot of the, like, the camera pans over and there's just one dude standing in the hallway. Yep. And you're just like, oh, well, what's that guy's deal? So, we're at the end here. Do yeah. you want to kind of recap the ending? Sure. Uh, the rescue team, quote unquote, has finally arrived, led by uh, a man who claims to have designed the Bishop Android, also played by Lance Henriksen, and credited in the end credits as Bishop 2, mm-hmm. which I think there's been some interesting conversations about whether or not he's actually an android as well. Uh, 
I don't know. I, I think he's human, yeah. but I I do think it's interesting that uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the <laughs> debate comes from the fact that he gets his fucking ear torn off and doesn't really react. That's to true. It. That's true. Yeah. So he he tells Ripley, "Hey, we're gonna try to figure out a way to get this creature out of you, and then we're gonna kill it. Like, don't worry about it. We'll take care of you. Trust us. Trust us." Yeah. And she doesn't believe him. Uh, in a scuffle, Aaron gets murdered by these Marines, mm-hmm. and Bishop Two yells at Ripley to come back and that he wants the specimen because yeah the company's still going to keep experimenting with these aliens if they get their hands on it yeah and so Ripley has Morse position their platform over this molten uh, lead in the refinery and tosses herself in and as she falls down oh my god the wildest <laughs> timing the uh, chest burster comes out of her and she holds it by the throat until she falls into the lava and dies it, it feels like a hat on a hat well that but it also it's the imagery it's trying to evoke is she gave birth and then she's like holding her baby as yeah. she's falling into this into the this fire <sighs> yeah is it the same in the assembly in the assembly cut there's no chest burster in the assembly cut that's she, what I thought. she jumps in and she has a look of peace on her face that's so much better honestly it's so much better it's so, so much, much better, better. <laughs> the the chest burster coming out i had always okay so here's my problem with this movie i'd only <laughs> ever seen it once and i thought i was having fake memories of this chest burster coming out of her chest because i was remembering the notes about the assembly cut uh-huh. i'm like oh no that doesn't happen and then i'm watching it today i'm like oh it does happen but I, I was vindicated. <laughs> it's uh yeah, it's such a weird choice and it it feels like it doesn't doesn't rob her of her agency at the end, yeah. but it makes it feel even less like she had a choice. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's also very funny to think that if she hadn't jumped into the lava and had gone with Bishop, they'd get halfway down the hallway and yeah. this thing pops out and kills all of them. Well, is, is, so. it, is the question that it popped out right that moment because it was done gestating or did it pop out because it, it could it felt the impending death that was coming? I mean, possibly. This movie plays fast and loose with how long they have to gestate compared yeah. to the other movies. Yeah. Because I don't remember how long it took. What's his face from the first one, right? To uh, chest burst versus this one, but this, yeah, it's a it's a bit. No, yeah. but uh, Ripley's dead. Morse is the final survivor who's led away by Waylon Yutani to uh, presumably go to a different prison facility. Yeah, and we end on a shot of uh, the final transmission from the the original Nostromo yeah saying this is Ellen Ripley signing off yeah kind of recapping the events of the first movie which is a not a not a bad uh, bookend no not at all I it's somber and I do think huge mistake bringing her back for the next one yeah. I know she's a clone in the next one but I'm like this is a kind of a good ending cap to the story of Ripley I totally agree and that's why I'm saying I don't I think the story is kind of bigger than her at that point I think you can start over and do something else right so it's a shame. Uh, and it's a shame we won't get Neil Blomkamp's version. Right. And we got Alien Covenant, which I did not like. Yeah, I don't either. I will go to bed for Prometheus, though. Yeah. I don't care. I'll go down swinging. I think that movie's amazing. I like <laughs> Prometheus. I, I have some logic problems with sure. that movie, but sure. but the vibes are immaculate. Can I tell you, that I, I was listening to a podcast last night talking about this movie, and they got up on attention about Prometheus. Mm. And they had a good point. I don't want to get too in the weeds about it, but okay. they had a good point of like, when they get to the planet in Prometheus, the reason everyone is making stupid decisions is because the planet is influencing them. Uh. And, and the evidence they provided is like everyone that has a strength has it turned on them. Like the pilot crashes into the planet. Mm-hmm. The uh, biologist starts touching and talk like without a suit on touching a plant that's there, like a creature. And mm-hmm. like it all kind of like plays like everybody that's there, their strengths become their weaknesses. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. Interesting. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll roll with that. I mean, the movie, the movie's so full of allegory over plot yep. that I, I think that works. That movie's all vibes for me. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> I also think that the cast is top notch. Oh like I mean, Nomi, Nomi Rapace alone. Like, I'll, I'll watch her do anything. Logan Marshall Green is bad. unsunk. Like, I need that dude in more stuff. Yeah. How he is not a bigger star, I do not know. If you haven't seen The Invitation Listener with Logan Marshall Green, yeah. it is one of the best horror movies of like the past century. And I we got to do it on the show at some point. Okay, it's, I'm down. He, he is so fucking good in that movie. I don't think I've seen that one. Oh my, dude, it is incredible. Like, it's a good, he's a very smart horror movie character i'll say that cool but it is i don't want to give any more away it is a very upsetting movie and it is also a very good movie 
So right on. Okay. Is there any other final thoughts before we get to prop cop and all the goodies here at the end? No, I, I just, I am glad that we had a, we both kind of are on the middle in this one mm-hmm. and, and, and we're able to have a, a good conversation with not because I, I I agree like it's so hard to get past the opening of this movie that I think that a lot of people miss the the good stuff that follows right. that opening sequence and uh, Mally let us know before we got on air that he didn't like this movie but he's not here to defend himself so his opinion gets put in the toilet I think he said <laughs> it's not it's not bad right isn't that what he said I don't think he I think he's more lukewarm on this one than us I said I thought this movie was not nearly as bad as people made it out to be and he said oh that's a wrong opinion hey. but you know what I, he's not here to defend himself that's true so <laughs> uh, why don't we get to prop cop for new listeners of the show prop cop is where we look at all of the props in the movie we're talking about this week and then that's of course alien 3 and we cop one for ourselves yeah. hence the name of the segment nathan this is your pick for this week mm-hmm. what is a prop you want from alien 3 i really like the warden sassy little glass tea set mm-hmm I like that too. I wanted that. I wanted that tea or coffee or whatever they're drinking, but I'll, I'll take the tea set. Gotcha. Um, I want one of those electric torches that they use in the maze. Oh, I thought yeah. those things were really cool. Yeah. I, I think one of them burns out at some point and like they try to like throw it out. That's at right. The I thought that was pretty good. Yeah. I think it, it reminded me, I almost picked that, but I think I took the, the electric torch in life. Yeah. Which is those are cool. Kind of those similar. are pretty cool. <laughs> Okay, so the next segment we got here is bit part where we recast one of the smaller characters with ourselves. Mm-hmm. This one's kind of difficult considering most of the characters here are named yeah. or have a line, but there is a couple. Mm-hmm. So I'll tell you mine. I want to be this uh, weird glasses wearing guy in the hazmat suit that comes <laughs> in at the end and asks where Ripley is. Oh, yeah. He's got the weirdest glasses I've ever seen on. They're, yeah, they're a trip. I love his line delivery, too. He's mm-hmm. just very clinical and very straightforward. Yep. He's like, why, why did you? You, why is she not in quarantine? Yeah, yeah I like I like that guy a lot. Uh, who do you want to be? Um, I don't know if he's named or not, but there is a prisoner when Ripley is like kind of giving them the lowdown on the xenomorph mm-hmm. and her previous fights with it. She says, this one's different from the others I fought. The others were afraid of fire. And it cuts to a dude just sort of rolling his eyes and exhaling. Yeah. And it made me <laughs> laugh really hard. Like, oh, great. I guess I'll just fucking pull out a fire. I know. I, I do like that repeatedly. They're like, we need weapons. Uh, we don't really have weapons. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we need to make something. Uh, everything here is fucked. We don't <laughs> do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's one, Oh, there's one bit where she's like, what about torches? And Aaron goes like, of course we do, but we don't have any fucking batteries. Yeah, no, it's just <laughs> flashlights. Well, we have thousands of flashlights, but no That's batteries. what it is. Oh, it made me laugh so hard. We're still using batteries in 2179. We really don't have anything better. <laughs> I know. I don't know. Well, without further ado, mm. why don't we give our silver lining for Alien Cube? All right. I'll go ahead and go. Yeah. Mine was that once again, uh-huh. Waylon Yutani got fucked. <laughs> so <laughs> fuck them. That that was mine as well. The oh. company was left empty handed. But I'll, I'll also add on that Ripley finally doesn't have to fight anymore. Good point. And since Mally's not here, I'll throw in another. Sure. Charles S. Dutton redeemed himself. Nice. Yeah. 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 That's good. I mean, ultimately, that the the lead didn't kill the alien, uh-huh. but it was it was pretty much dispatched right after. So it's all good. Sure. <laughs> okay. Well, if you're a recurring listener of our show, you know that at the end of every episode, we like to give listeners for the movie of the week an alternative, something you double feature and play back to back with the movie of the week. Mm-hmm. Nathan, what is a movie people should watch before? Or after, I guess, uh-huh. for uh, Alien 3 that will balance things out nicely. Well, I really missed the Marines in this one, but mm-hmm. I don't know that, you know, a- I mean, obviously, if you're going to marathon these, Aliens would, would come up. But if you're still wanting to see some uh, some action heroes taking on nasty aliens, fire up Paul Verhoeven's Starship Troopers. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Hey. <laughs> A movie that I think was grossly misunderstood when it came out and still, still is. is to this day. Still is, yep. considering there's so many sequels to that movie that uh, no one seems to have gotten the whole point of that first movie. Mm-hmm. So Absolutely. I'm going to pick a movie that is also about prisoners yeah. and dealing with a warden that goes out in a pretty cool way. I'm going to go with The Shawshank Redemption. Oh, great choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love how that warden goes out in that movie. Fuck that guy. <laughs> I- I'll go ahead and tell you what I think Mally's would have been. Okay. Just because he suggested this movie before. And it's also a movie about prisoners getting into all kinds of shenanigans. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go with Con Air. Oh, of course. Yes. Gotta be. Good choice. Gotta be. 
Well, this is not spooky linings, but it is a horror movie. So I figured we can go ahead and throw this question out there too. What mm. do you think is the best kill of this movie? I think it's Charles Dance. Yeah. 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 It's either that or the dude who gets the the alien tongue through his head Oof. through the door. Yeah. I, my, my second option was just the guy that falls into the fucking fans. because it's, it's so ridiculous. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Uh, okay. So to put a final stamp on it, mm-hmm. do we recommend David Fincher's Alien 3? I think so. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, it's a, it's a worthy companion to the other, the first two. Yeah. I think if you're going to marathon them, just stop here. You'll yep. have a, a better time that way. Yep. I also wanted to throw out something I, I fully forgot to mention earlier. I think Elliot Goldenthal's score in this movie yeah. is really good. It's pretty cool. He really embraces the sort of gothic tones and, and also has a little bit of fun with the action sequences. It's a it's a really solid score. Yeah, I dig it too. Yeah, I recommend it as well. I think it's an interesting look at where David Fincher started. Yeah. And how decent a movie he was able to put out under the worst circumstances a filmmaker can be put under. Absolutely. I think this movie's not great, but it is far from an absolute shit show that people try to make it out to be. Mm-hmm. And I think Fincher, I hope one day he does come around to the idea of doing uh, a director's cut. I know it's probably a terrible experience for him, and it sounds like he's still kind of jilted by it, mm-hmm. but this is not anything to be that embarrassed about or to be that upset about, I don't think. Again, I wasn't there so i don't know but this finished product is not that bad i mean i you know this was trial by fire for him right oh, 100%. like 100 he, he makes seven after this right so. and he may have made a better movie than anyone else could have under the circumstances yeah. but it's you know as a 28 year old by the way right we should mention he was 28 making this movie like, but it's like if you if you escape uh you know if your boat you know cap sizes and you survive you're probably not going to go on a boat anytime soon for like, sure he doesn't he doesn't want to relive it Well, I will say, too, the reason Seven got made is because one of the producers of this movie felt so bad for how things turned out that he gave him the opportunity to make Seven later. That's right. So, it kind of all worked out. Which really play it worked out because then what, what's the i mean his run is insane right there it's like seven the game fight club panic room like the dude just did not slow down for a, a good chunk of time yeah absolutely well that's alien three listen if you haven't already subscribe wherever you're listening to right now mm-hmm. and uh i really want to hammer the point of please leave us a rating and some feedback that really helps grow our audience more than you can imagine yeah if you haven't already you can follow us as well on twitter instagram and tiktok where we post pretty much every day during the active seasons and you can check out our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash silver linings playlist if you want to tell us how you feel about the movie alien 3 or any other uh, movie we covered on the show if you want to give us a suggestion for a movie to cover or just tell us how we're doing you can get in touch with us at uh, the silver lines playlist at gmail.com now next week is my pick yeah and i have a couple clues Ooh. honestly for what we're talking about next week so much like this week's movie alien 3 next week we're picking up right where we left off in this episode, and uh, it'll be the shortest episode yet. <laughs> so, do with that what you will, and we're going back to familiar territory, honestly. Yeah. Um, you could say next week's is another ringer with the slick trigger finger for Her Majesty. <laughs> and uh, between now and then, Nathan, I just need a little bit of solace. Right. Just, I need the smallest amount. Um, just a skosh of solace. <laughs> some, some would refer to it as a quantum. I need a, a quantum mania. Yeah, I want- <laughs> I wonder what next week is. <laughs> We're doing Ant-Man 4 or whatever the fuck movie it is. I can't remember. I can't keep up with them anymore. I'm so looking forward to it. I'm excited to talk about next week's movie. Uh, I f- it's going to be an interesting one. Uh, any closing thoughts? Any final words uh, before we get out of here? Nah. All right. Well, uh, rest in peace, Oatmeal. And I guess rest in peace, Ripley. Ripley and, and Bishop and uh, all the guys. All, all the dudes. Clemens. And uh, as always... God will take care of you now, sister. (laughs) Excelsior. 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 Look it up. This is rumor control. Here are the facts. And that 
wraps up another fantastic episode of the Silver Linings playlist. If you would be so kind, we ask that you leave us some feedback on how we did, plus a like and subscribe. We'll be back next week with another great episode. See ya!